how far does forgiveness extend? What are its possibilities? Or maybe its limits? I want to tell you a story right now. And at the end of the story, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to think about something. It is a horrible and disturbing story, uh, but incredibly powerful. It's based on this book right here. Simon Wiesenthal wrote this book. It's an account of, uh, it's called a Sunflower, and it's an account of uh, his life in German, a German concentration camp. And it is disturbing. He was there for a couple of years. He saw 89 Simon Wiesenthal uh, of his family members die at the hands of the Jewish Nazis. And one day he was picking up trash in a uh, German hospital, army hospital. And a nurse came up to him and grabbed him and said, Hey, are you a Jew? And Wiesenthal nodded and, and she led him into the hospital, into this dark room with a single bed, chair next to it, and a single lamp. Uh, and in the bed was this bandaged up, uh, you could tell, seriously wounded soldier. The soldier was a Jewish Nazi soldier named Karl, who was fatally wounded, did not have much longer to live. And Karl starts out, the nurse sits Wiesenthal down and tells him to stay there until she gets him. Karl opens his mouth and, and struggling to speak, says, I must tell you of this horrible deed because you are a Jew. And Wiesenthal is, feels trapped and scared and doesn't know what to do because if, le- I mean, if he leaves a room and he's found somewhere he's not supposed to be, he's dead. So he stays in there. And he decides to just kind of swallow whatever uh, this German guy is, is going to share with him. And he tells him a pretty horrible story. Uh, Carl tells him of a time that he was in Russia. And he is in, in his company had just taken over this, this small Russian town. But apparently before the Russians left, they booby-trapped some houses. So as Germans were going through the houses, um, these booby traps exploded, went off, and some, some German soldiers, some of Carl's buddies died. Well, they were so angry that they decided to uh, act uh, in revenge. And the commanding officer told Carl and his buddies in his company to go throughout the town and round up every Jewish person that they could and bring them to this one house. So Carl says about three to maybe 400 Jewish men and women and children and old people, anybody, it didn't matter. And they they brought them into this, rounded them up, put them in this house and then a truck came uh, and on this truck were cans of, of uh, gasoline and they, they asked, they didn't ask, they told the Jewish, strong, the youngest Jewish men, the strongest ones in there to go to the truck and bring these gasoline cans inside the house. So they did that, they're all in the house, the commanding officer told that Carl and his buddies to form a perimeter around the house and he gave two orders first order was throw your grenade inside the house the second order was to shoot anybody who tried to escape and the German German Nazi soldiers obeyed the order and as 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 Carl was sharing this Simon Wiesenthal was sick inside and could not handle it and as Carl was sharing about the the, the, the the sick smell of the smoke and the human flesh burning and the sounds of screams that were still in his head, Wiesenthal got up the courage to leave. But Carl grabbed him and said, please sit down. I have more to say. And then, then Carl talks about the moment he directed his eyes to the third floor and a window on the third floor of this house where he locked eyes with this Jewish man who was holding a a young child with the man had uh, his hand uh, over the young child's eyes and next to the man and the child was obviously the wife and and the mother and as as Carl locked eyes with this young family this young man they jumped and um, and Carl says at that moment of time you know it froze and he could see this family in the air but he could hear bullets and, and, and Carl wonders if they were dead by the time they hit the ground. And he told Simon Wiesenthal that to this day he can still see that family. And as, as, as Carl is sharing this, 
you could tell, he, Simon Wiesenthal could tell that Carl was tortured and that Carl was remorseful and that Carl was really feeling guilty because of this. And Carl goes on and, and, and shares that um, how he got shot and how he got blown up and how he ended up in this hospital and he probably wasn't going to survive the day. Carl said this. He said that it, these are direct quotes. And I want to read them because I want to make sure I get it right. He said this, Carl said this to Simon Wiesenthal, the pains in my body are terrible, but worse still is my conscience. It never ceases to remind me of the burning house and the family that jumped from the window. So he's showing genuine remorse here. And Wiesenthal agrees, he sees it. He says, I cannot die without coming clean and this is my confession. In the last hours of my life, you are with me. And I don't know who you are. I only know that you are a Jew and that is enough. I know that what I have told you is terrible. In the long nights while I have been waiting for death, I have longed to talk about it with a Jew and beg forgiveness from him. Only I didn't know if there were any Jews left. I know that what I'm asking you is too much for you, but without an answer, I cannot die in peace. And Wiesenthal sat in silence and felt the burden, not just you know, of his people, on his shoulders and realized he was given the option to forgive or not forgive this guy. And Wiesenthal said after you know, what seemed like an eternity of uncomfortable silence. He said, at last, I made up my mind. And without a word, I got up, left the room, and shut the door. Story continues. He says he went and Fett was obviously shaken and disturbed by it and went and talked to his friends back in the barracks or, you know, wherever they were. And uh, his friends... Um, Arthur and Adam both were kind of callous and didn't care, weren't interested. Um, basically, you know, a Arthur was like, good, one less. And, and, and Adam was like, you know, I wish I could do what you did ten times a day. But he did have a friend named Josick who, who, who did talk about the experience with him and said, you know what, you couldn't have forgiven because according to Jewish law, you could only forgive that which was directly done to you. So because everything Carl did was not done to him, he had no right. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal had no right to forgive, but Josick said also that he would have done the same thing, and he would have done it without remorse. But it still gnawed at Simon Wiesenthal. His spirit was still unsettled. And about a year later, uh, to the concentration camp came a, a Polish priest or a priest candidate named named Bullock. And Bullock had been in Auschwitz and had been a you know, a prisoner in these concentration camps, a survivor, if you will. And uh, Simon Wiesenthal had a lot of respect for Bullock. And so he shared the story with Bullock. And Bullock said, he said, you know what, we're talking a year later, and you're still bothered by this. This is still a sensitive subject for you. There's unsettledness in your spirit. And so Bullock said, maybe this is a sign that your conscience is torn and maybe you should have forgiven. He also said that, you know, he reminded Simon Wiesenthal that Carl was dead and he is, he's gone. And, and this is still an issue, but it's an issue for, for you, Simon Wiesenthal, and maybe forgiveness is the way that you need to deal with this issue because, because Carl was repentant and that Carl gave his confession and it was no longer an issue for him, but it was for Wiesenthal. And maybe he said, hey, you should forgive. Well, they got separated. The war was over. Wiesenthal escaped the concentration camps and, uh, and lived his life. He actually went and tracked down Carl's mother and tells a story of their encounter. But I want to jump to the end of, 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 of Wiesenthal's story. Uh, at the end of his story, his last words to the reader, he says, You who have just read my account, this sad and tragic episode in my life, I challenge you 
to change places with me and ask yourself the crucial question, what would I have done? What would you have done had you been in Simon Wiesenthal's shoes? Forgive? Not forgive? Walk out in silence as he did? The book really doesn't end there. That's only the first half of the book. In the second half of the book, 53 religious and moral and political leaders weigh in on the matter and write a little essay on what they would have done. Some famous people like the Dalai Lama or Bishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa or even conservative columnist Dennis Prager weigh in on the matter and say, this is what I would have done had I been in Simon Wiesenthal's shoes. And just throw it out there, of the 53 who respond, 34 said, "You, I would not have forgiven. I would not have forgiven. 10 say they would have forgiven, and 9 say they weren't sure. But what would you do? Or what do you see you would have done? You know, talk about this and talk about these issues with your spouse. Talk about them with your adult children or older children that can handle a story like this. But it's an interesting and I think important moral story to, to consider. The possibilities and the extent of forgiveness. The Sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal, an incredibly powerful and provocative book that does explore, unlike any other I've read, the issue of forgiveness. So thanks for watching. God bless you, and always walk in peace.